Okay, great. So we're now going to uh, talk about how we can do a simple uh, simulation of electric fields with, with COMSOL. Uh, we have about, uh, about like uh, 35 minutes, and I think we can cover it in that time. So let's, the first thing I'd like to do is quickly go over with you some key concepts. So, here we go. So the idea of finite element analysis uh, basically is that you can create a computer model of a particular geometry. And in this case, we're doing a quadrupole, the same example that we did last time in class, except we solved it using Python uh, analytically. And this is where we're going to show you how to use numerical software to figure out what the electrostatic potentials and the electric field lines are. Um, so the way that these finite element tools, they solve for, uh, for the electrostatic potential is they use Poisson's equation. Okay, they don't use the integration approaches that I was just showing you earlier with the uh, with the surface, um, this, the volume, surface, and line integrals. Okay, we use an approach where we're actually doing um, using Poisson's equation. So let's let's go and see what that means. All right, Poisson's equation. Um, it this is this comes right out of Maxwell's equations. Del dot e. Uh, the divergence of e is equal to rho v over epsilon. This is the first Maxwell equation. Um, and then we know that electric field is equal to the negative gradient of the voltage. That's what we found out in this chapter. And so if you just take, do the math here, you get that the, that the uh, del squared v is equal to negative rho v over epsilon. So del squared v is called the Laplacian. Uh, it's called the Laplacian of the electrostatic potential. So del squared means Laplacian. V is the electrostatic potential. And this is equal to the rho uh, V, the charge density, divided by epsilon. So it's saying like the Laplacian of the electrostatic potential is equal to the amount of charge that you have in any given position. This is just a restatement of Maxwell's equations. In the special case where you don't have any charges at all, the uh, uh, del squared V is equal to zero. Um, the reason why this equation happens to be important is because we often don't solve this equation by hand, but electrostatic simulation tools like COMSOL use Poisson's equation to solve for the fields. Um, and this uh, uh, del squared V equals rho epsilon, this is an example of a partial differential equation. So you have differential terms on the left side. Um, if you recall, in, in a Cartesian coordinate system, for example, del squared V is equal to d squared v uh, dx squared plus d squared v dy squared plus d squared v dx squared or dz squared. All right. So there are these differential terms. All right. When you have di differential terms and they are a function of position, so x, y, and z are position variables, that is referred to as a partial differential equation. And uh, um, how many of you, just a quick show, just uh, indicate, um, just hit a yes or no if, you, if you've taken a partial differential course before. Okay, some of you have, that's good. It's good to know. Um, so partial differential equations are often solved and in, in uh, typical uses are often solved by computer simulation tools. So let's get right to it. Uh, COMSOL is uh, a, a finite element analysis software, and the way finite element tools work is they use numerical methods to solve partial differential equations. The, there's four steps to the process, and we're going to go through the four steps right now. Um, the first step is we're going to build the geometry, and then we define the model, we mesh the model, and then we do post-processing on the results. So um, the first thing we're going to do is build a geometry. So we have to build um, what we're trying to simulate. And what we're going to be simulating today is a quadrupole. So last time in class I showed you if you had four discrete charges with some, um, four discrete charges with a specific amount of charge at each of the four points. Uh, the problem we're going to do today is a little bit different, but very similar, uh, where you have four points, you have four of these points, and the four points are at, at different voltages. So um, in particular, this one is, these two voltages are going to be positive, and then these two voltages are, are going to be negative. They're all going to be a constant. All right, so we're just going to define the locations of these objects, and it can be one-dimensional or two-dimensional. It can be done in Cartesian or cylindrical coordinates. These are the ones one supported in COMSOL. 
um, say 1, 1D, 2D, or 3D. 3D is also supported in COMSOL. But uh, boundary, uh, but uh, 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 coordinate systems, Cartesian and cylindrical, are the ones that are supported. The next thing we're going to do is define our model and material properties and boundary conditions. So what that means is we are going to um, uh, we are going to indicate that hey, this big square that you see here, this is air. This is air, and air has a relative permittivity of of one. We'll talk about permittivities later. Um, and then these are going to be four conductive, four pieces of metal. So four conductive circles, and we'll say that that's copper. And then we'll, we're going to indicate the boundary conditions. Boundary conditions means we're going to say this is at plus V, and then these two circles are at minus V. All right, so those are the parts. You can material properties relevant to um, uh, electrostatics. So electrostatics, the PDE that we solve is Poisson's equation. The material properties that are relevant to electrostatics is just the dielectric constant. When we start working with currents, we'll also be looking at conductivity as a material parameter. Right now, just permittivities are fine. And then the boundary conditions, we specify a voltage or charge at any of the boundaries. So for this simulation, we're going to simulate a voltage. Um, the next step is you want to mesh the model. So meshing the model is a, it's a numerical way to solve the partial differential equation. The strategy is we break the geometry up into a bunch of teeny tiny pieces, uh, we call the elements. And we solve um, we solve the the Laplace I'm sorry we we solve Poisson's equation at every single element, and it turns out that by breaking the model up into small pieces, you can assume linear behavior in each one of those small pieces, and that transforms this entire thing into a system of linear equations. And if any of you have taken a course in linear algebra, you know that if you have a system of linear equations, it, it can be expressed as a matrix. And the matrix can then be solved um, by a computer to find the best approximate solution to that system of equations. So essentially, by meshing the model, we're transforming it into a system of linear equations. And then we can solve for that. This is a massive matrix with thousands of elements, but our computational um, capabilities are pretty good nowadays. So it's, it solves pretty quickly. Um, if you want to get a more accurate answer, you do a finer mesh. Uh, meaning you have smaller elements, and if you if you want, um, but that takes more computation time. If you want to do a faster computation but less accurate, you use a more rough mesh. And then the, finally, you get to the results. We'll do surface plots of of the electrostatic potential, and then we'll also do some arrow plots of the electric fields, and then we'll also do some streamlines to show the paths of the particles in an electric field. So let's get right to it. Um, I'm going to be moving fairly quickly so we can try to finish up by the end of class. So I'm going to go ahead and um, in VLab. So I would like for you guys to follow along if you've already installed it. Um, I'm going to, okay, you can see the VLab on my, on my screen here. That's good. And I'm actually going to maximize this a little bit more. Oops. I will just share the VLab window so that you can see that easier. Hopefully it'll be less distracting. There you go. All right. Now we're going to go through this quickly, but if you um, you're going to find Compsol on here, just type that in. It's in the Start menu. And wait for Compsol to start up. So COMSOL, fortunately, is available through VLab, so you will be able to do your COMSOL assignments um, just by logging in remotely. You won't need to go into campus. So fortunately, our, um, our engineering uh, IT services has been able to set that up for us. So what we're going to do is we're going to say we're going to create a model. Okay, so we'll go to the model wizard, and we're going to be doing a two-dimensional simulation here. So um, let's click 2D here. Um, there are a lot of different physics that we have available in COMSOL. Obviously, for this class, we're going to be doing um, electrostatics. So under the AC-DC module, just select electrostatics here like this, and we will add it here. There's many other types of simulations that you can do in COMSOL, ranging from fluidics to thermal to chemical diffusion, everything. And we are going to be doing a stationary study this time, which means that we're going to be doing a DC simulation. Electric fields do not change with time. 
So that's why we're picking stationary. Otherwise, we'd probably pick frequency domain or time dependent. We're going to keep it simple here today. Uh, Isa is typing something, so yeah, Isa, go ahead. All right. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to add some materials here. Uh oh. All right. Um, uh oh. Did I did we lose the screen share? Can you all see this console screen? Uh, give me a thumbs up. Okay, good. All right. So the first thing we're going to do today is we're going to create some, a couple materials. And we'll try to work quickly. Um, so you're going to right click here and click add material from library. So we're going to choose air as one of the materials. And we will also choose, we're going to choose copper as our metal. All right, now when you look at these materials, you're going to see the materials pop up under here under component. And um, see that the, the material properties that we're most interested in for air is, um, yes, that's right, common model inputs. The material properties that we're most interested in is the um, uh, permittivity. You can see that there's a lot of different uh, parameters here, but the, the ones that we're most interested in is, is the uh, relative permittivity, this one. Okay, um, all these other ones will actually not be used here. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is create the geometry. So to create the geometry, we're going to go under geometry here, and you'll see just a blank screen here like this. So we're going to actually draw out um, the, uh, the system here. Now I want to show you um, a little trick here. We can create a parameter. We're going to call this parameter R. Okay, and uh, this is like creating a variable. And for right now, we're going to set R equal to uh, one millimeter, so one e negative three. So this is the the um, the distance between the uh, um, uh, the distance between the two points of a monopole, the, the size of the monopole. Okay, and you'll see what that means once we start defining the geometry. So, we're, we're gonna, first thing we're going to do is draw our box of air. So we created a rectangle. Right click on geometry and say you want to add a rectangle. And uh, we'll say this is 2R. 2 times R is going to be the width. And 2 times R is going to be the height of this rectangle. And we're going to place that rectangle. We're going to say the position is right in the center of the, uh, right at the center, right at x equals 0 and y equals 0. Click, go up here and click Build Objects. And you can see that the, the square showed up. Um, the other, there's a lot of other things that you can modify here. You can look through those later. But right now, we're just going to add in our um, elements of the quadruple. Now here you can see that there's a lot of different types of things that you can draw. This is essentially a drawing program. Um, you can click circle here. So we're going to create a circle. And we're going to say that circle is um, uh, r over 10. So, so it's 1 millimeter divided by 10, which means about 100 microns. Actually, we'll make it like r over 20 to make them even a little bit smaller. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to put the first of our... Um, uh, poles here. We're going to locate this at at r, at x equals r, and y equals r. So when I hit build all objects, you'll see that, oh, that's not the right place. We'll put it r over 2. Okay, center that r over 2. All right, and you can see that one of the circles shows up here. All right, um, now, let us add three more circles. And rather than adding four different circles, which we could easily do, I'm going to show you a little trick on how you can also copy them. So you can go to uh, Transforms, and you can, uh, um, you can mirror this. Mirroring means you can uh, mirror it over the x or the y axis. 
And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to select the input object here like so. I'm going to select that and I'm going to say I want to mirror that across the y-axis. So I'm going to keep the input object, meaning I'm going to copy it, but I'm also going to keep the one, keep the object that was copied. And um, the point it asks you to input a point on the line of reflection and a normal vector to the line of reflection. So this means I'm going to pick the origin as the point, and I'm going to pick a vector x equals 1 and y equals 0. So the vector would point horizontally, so that's normal to the line of reflection. And I'm going to click Build All Objects here like so. And that's going to create, just copy that object across the y-axis. Now to make the last two, I'm going to again do, um, I'm going to again mirror this. And now I'm going to select both of these objects as the objects that I want to mirror. And I'm going to mirror them across the x-axis now. So I'm going to change this to 0 and then this to 1. My normal vector is going to point in the y direction, so that will be normal to the x-axis. Build all the objects, and you can see that I have my 4 here. All right. Now I've built my geometry. I'm going to make one little modification here, is that I'm going to make these a little bit larger. Make the box a little bit larger. Make it 3R instead of 2R. All right. And this is the button. Zoom extents is a helpful one where you can, um, this zooms out to fit the entire uh, model here. So this is a little bit too big. Let's make it 2.5. So what we're doing here is we're, um, the electric field that we're simulating is going to be in the air, right? There's no electric field within the conductor. We're going to find out more about that later. But the electric field is going to be in this air element. So we just want to make sure that there's enough of the air element so we can see the entire electric field. Okay, so um, any questions, please feel free to add it to the public chat. I'll be checking from time to time. Um, the next thing we're going to do here, we've defined it. We've already added our materials, and now we're just going to define what the materials are. So I click, click here, and I click air. So I want to choose which one of my elements is going to be air. So we're going to choose this guy here. This is going to be air. So everything except for the four posts. And you can select it in this domain. Um, if I go here and select copper, and what elements are going to be copper? I'm actually going to select uh, one, two, three, and four. OK, did I get all those? There you go. So one, three, so this means uh, objects one, three, four, and five are going to be considered copper. Now I want to show you what happened to the air thing here. So the first material we entered was air. That means like it console first assumes that all the um, everything you drew is all the air object. But but what we did in the second step is that we said no. Uh, these four objects, 1, 3, 4, and 5, these circles are, are copper. So notice here, now it says that under the air, it says that 1, 3, 4, 5 have been overridden. So those are a different material. So um, uh, object 2, which is a big square, that is air. Oh, wait, I didn't do this correctly. Shoot. I didn't do this correctly. So what we're going to do is we're going to remove this. We'll remove all these and just select them again manually. OK, so 4 and 5 I see are on here. Now I also need to select here. There we go, we got it. All right, the four internal ones are being selected as copper, and the one is selected as air. Okay, air has a, a relative permittivity of one, copper also has a relative permittivity of one. Now we're going to get to the uh, boundary conditions. 
So the, the boundary conditions is the, the third step, as I showed you. You know, first you define the geometry, then you define the materials, and now we're going to define the boundary conditions. So in the electrostatics module that you see here, so um, you'll see that electrostatics is one of them here. Within the electrostatics module, you'll see charge conservation, zero charge, and initial values. Um, so charge conservation means we're actually solving um, the Poisson's equation uh, in this domain. So um, it's actually being solved in, 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 in all of it. It's being solved within the posts, and it's also being solved in the air around the posts. Um, if you click here, you can see you can see all the areas where uh, all the uh, the equation is being solved, and the equation itself is shown here under equation. So you can see here now that you you know you guys are experts in Maxwell's equations, you can see that this is the Maxwell's equations here. Del dot e is equal to rho v. That's Maxwell equation number one, and then the second one is e equals negative uh, del v. That's what we just learned in this chapter. So really, this this software is just helping you solve the equations that we've already learned about in this lab, or in this class. Um, some other things like model input, temperature, and absolute pressure, that's um, not all that relevant to this particular simulation. Um, the electric field, the constitutive relation, um, D is equal to epsilon E. We're going to talk about that later in the class, but that's also um, you know, a pretty standard equation. That's part of the Maxwell's equations. All right. So now that we have our, uh, we're going to add our boundary conditions. Um, this zero charge means there's zero charges at the boundary here, um, and this initial value is saying that the initial guess for the electrostatic potential is zero. This is not that important because actually we're going to be actually solving for the electrostatic potential. Okay, now we're actually going to put in the the boundary condition that we're talking about. As I said before, we want to make these two a positive voltage, this one and this one. And we want to make these two a negative voltage. So what I can do here is I will right click on here and I'm going to I'm going to look at all these different options. Lots of boundary conditions that you can put in here. Okay, but we're just going to focus on the electric potential. Okay, so what we can do now is we can select um, we can select these. So I'm going to just going to zoom in here like this. And I'm going to select these four ends here. Let's zoom out here. And these four here. All four ends of Post. I'm going to set them equal to let's set let's set them equal to one volt. Or let's see, it's ten volts just for the heck of it. All right, and now I'm also going to create a second electrostatic potential. To select this again, and this time I'm going to select the other two. Zoom out here like this. And this time I'm going to select negative 10. All right, so you see I've added these two potential electrostatic potential boundary conditions in different parts of the box. And you can, when you click on them, you'll see the domains or the, or the surfaces that you applied that potential to. These uh, two surfaces are at negative V, and then these two surfaces are at positive V. What I can do even make this, to, to parameterize this, I can also say V, this is the voltage, I'll make this voltage equal to 10. And instead of putting in a specific number here, I can, I can just put the name of the variable. You can say this is V, and then this is negative v. This is going to help us when we do parameterized simu simulations. All right, next step, we're going to mesh the model. We just click on mesh here, and then we can just click here where it says build mesh or build all. They'll both do the same thing. We mesh this, and you see that it's broken up into small elements here. 
We can choose the size of the mesh by choosing the element size here. So we'll just make this mesh a little bit finer like this and we'll build it again. And you can see that there are many more mesh elements. Um, the first time we meshed it, there was 3,500 domain elements down here. The second time we meshed it, there's 5,000. And if you start making these like extra fine, then obviously like it gets, you know, we have 10,000 elements and you just have to be careful about how much the computation time will take. I, it, for a two-dimensional simulation, we could even choose extremely fine and it'll still solve very, very quickly. Um, but just for, you know, I think this is fine for us. So the, the next part is now we have to define our study. So we're just doing a stationary uh, study. And um, there's a lot of different options that you can configure here, but we'll leave those out for now. There's, there's nothing that's really needed. Um, and we can just hit compute. Compute the selected study. And when we compute it, we'll be able to see the results. So let's just give it a second to solve. You can see that uh, it'll give you, um, you know, it says a solution time was six seconds. So it actually solves very, very quickly. Um, Song is asking, is a software like NX12 or Cadia 3D Design? It, you know, um, I, I believe Cadia 3D Design is uh, a way to create three-dimensional models. Uh, I don't know if Cadia 3D is used to, to solve for things like electrostatic potentials or mechanical strain or things like that. Um, so that being said, you can, you know, just using the, the geometry function here, you can create some pretty complex three-dimensional models in Comsol for purpose of simulation. You can also import models that have been made in other softwares like Cadia or like AutoCAD and import them into Comsol if you so wish. All right, now, um, so this is a plot of the electrostatic potential. And I'm gonna show you how to make a couple other plots here. Uh, first of all, now we're in the, down in the results section here. We've kind of worked our way from top to bottom here. Um, under data sets, you can see that there is the study one solution. That's the one that we just solved for. Um, and then there's also a plot here. Now this is, uh, you can see here, this is very important. This is a two dimensional plot group. So there's 3D plots, 2D plots, and 1D plots. We'll go over a couple of them real quick. Um, the electric potential here is shown here. Um, you can see that these positive two, um, the positive electrodes that were at a positive potential, you can see they're red. This color bar will tell you the potential here. So this is at 10 volts. And then the blue side is obviously a negative 10 volts, these two. And you can see a color gradient in the middle to show you how the electrostatic potential is varying as you move through the middle of the field. So it's, it's quite, you know, it's quite a, a, a nice visual. So the next thing we're probably going to do is say like, hey, I want to draw the, I want to draw the electric field line. So let's look at this plot first. So um, this is what's called a surface plot. If I right click here, if I right click on a group, in fact, let's just delete this completely. And I delete this completely. We're going to create a plot group from scratch. And uh, so right click on results and say, I want to add a two dimensional plot group. And in that two-dimensional plot group, I want to add a surface plot. There's a lot of different plots you can do. We'll do the surface one first. And we'll call this um, potential. Uh, the data set is from the parent. The expression that we're going to plot is the electrostatic potential. You can choose other expressions as well. There's a nice menu here where you can choose, for example, um, you can choose the electrostatic potential, which is capital V. You can choose the magnitude of the electric field, which is es.norm.e. Um, so let me just show you that real quick. If you plot it, you see this is where the electric field is. The electric field is strongest near the electrodes, and they, it becomes weaker as you go further, further and further away. So let's switch back to V. That's the one that we were interested in, and plot that, the electrostatic potential. And Let's say I also I want to add the electric field lines, just like we did with the Python simulation. So I'm going to add to this plot. I'm going to add a surface plot like this. Okay, you see how it says arrow surface here. And we'll call, it, we'll call this electric field, call it whatever we want. Um, we choose an X component for the arrow and a Y component for the arrow. So if you look here, you know, it's, it's, it's given by default, but basically you know, vector quantities, you can choose the electric displacement field, the electric field, or the polarization. We're choosing the electric field here. 
the, so ex, the x component of the arrow will be the x component of the field, and the y component of the arrow will be the y component of the field. Um, now down here, if we plot this, you will see some of the um, arrows show up. These arrows indicate the direction of the electric field. So I'm not seeing that many arrows here, so I like to bump up the number of points. Instead of 15, um, 15 arrows across the x-axis, I'm going to double it. I'm going to make it 30. And I'm also going to do the same for the y-axis so I can see more arrows. All right. Now what you're going to see is a problem that often happens. Now that I have a lot more arrows, there's a lot of arrows that are close to the electrodes. And the electrodes have a very high electric field. So when you have proportional arrows, a lot of these other arrows cannot be seen. So what I like to do is a few tricks. I can take the scale factor here and manually adjust it like this so you can make them a little bit bigger. But even that doesn't really help much. So I like to change the arrow length to be uh, logarithmic. Or if you change it to normalized, then all the arrows have the same size, regardless of the field intensity. You want the places to have strong fields. You want them to have larger arrows that you can see um, you know, the distribution of where you have a strong field and where you don't. So if you, I like to use a logarithmic approach where the length of the arrows will be uh, logarithmically defined. And so then you can, you can kind of still see a little bit about where the uh, field lines are stronger, but it's not a linear function. So that's why you're able to see uh, the high fields here. And at the same time, you're able to see the smaller fields here. Let me make this a little bit larger for you to see. All right. Um, now, there's, uh, let's say I want to show the streamlines instead. So I actually am going to disable this electric field plot. I'm going to right click on this and go to disable. Right. And you see that the potential plot is still there, but the electric field plot has been removed, or disabled, I should say. So to this, I'm going to, I'm going to add a, a streamline. And the streamline plot I'm going to show is uh, EX and EY, also the electric field. So we'll call this the E field streamlines. And what you're going to see here is you're going to see a, se a series of lines. Um, in order for this to work, you actually have to select uniform density and change this to say 0 0.02. And you'll, you should be able to see the field lines here. Now what you're seeing here is you are seeing um, uh, wherever you saw electric field arrows here. Look, I'll, uh, we'll include this here. I'm going to re-enable this so you can see. So the streamlines are kind of a, a neater way for you, see, for, for you to see the electric field lines. Um, they follow the directions of the arrows, but they're just straight lines instead of arrows. So it comes out, it, it looks a little bit cleaner. Now the reason why streamlines are actually important and why a lot of engineers tend to use them let me just disable this so you can see it better, is that they describe the path of a particle if a particle were, were to be placed in the field. Let me just bump this up to 40. So we have a higher density of lines here. Oh, oops. I want to disable that. I want to make my streamlines. I want to make them a little bit more dense, so I'll make this 0.01 instead of 0.02. Okay, now this shows very densely like what the field lines look like. So what this means, like field lines, uh, it means that if I were to place a particle, like a, a charged particle, um, at, at this point where this electrode is, um, the charged particle would actually travel along one of these streamlines. So the charged particle would travel from here to here. If, if, I were to put it, if I were to put a charged particle at this point in space, the charged particle would travel right along this line here, the one that it happens to be on. And the magic of this, the quadrupole, is that if, if you notice that there are no um, lines in the middle, this is because there's no electric field in the middle. And so if I happen to put a charge right in the middle of that quadrupole, that charge is actually going to be trapped inside. And that's one of the reasons why physicists and uh, engineers like to use quadrupoles for doing all sorts of cool analysis. Okay, so you have a sense for... Um, how to do this uh, plotting. There's one more thing I want to show you real quick. Again, if people have to go, it's going to take about five or ten, five minutes or so, I think. And, um, you know, feel free to watch the video later. But you'll, you'll have some assignments on this, so it's to your advantage if you, you know, just uh, make sure you know how to do this. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to um, 
I'm going to create, I'm going to do a parametric simulation. So let's just remove, disable this for the time being and just look at the scalar potential. Now, one of the advantages of console or simulation tool, the reason you use it is because you're trying to do some kind of design. And if you're trying to design something, you'll often wonder, okay, well, if I change a certain parameter, how will that change how the, um, how the system works? And so fortunately, what we did is we defined these parameters earlier. We defined the geometry R, and we also defined the geometry, or we defined the voltage V. And I'm going to show you real quick how to do a parametric study. So I'm going to right-click on study one, and I'm going to say, I want to do a parametric sweep. So I'm going to vary the voltage. So in parametric sweep, you'll see the different options and what, what uh, parameters you want to vary. I click here to say, hey, I want to vary the V parameter, the voltage that I set these uh, electrodes to. And on the value list, I'm going to click here and say uh, where it says range. And I'm going to, I'm going to put a range. I'm going to say start at uh, 0 volts um, in steps of 2, and it will go all the way up to 10. So that means we're going to uh, go from 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. So five different values, six different values. OK? And uh, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to compute the parametric sweep. And what this is going to do, this is going to actually, um, all right, parametric sweep, there's a compute button up here. This is actually going to run the simulation for many different values of the voltage. And you can see here in the progress. that um well we should be able to okay so there must be something going on here so let me try uh, deleting the stationary um let's do this one Okay, so this parametric sweep, what it's supposed to do, it's supposed to um, uh, simulate um, where you vary this, this parameter v, and then, you, um, and then you get all the results in one. So parametric solutions, you should be able to see the solution at, um, for different values of the parameter. And it looks like something's goofy here, something's not uh, working as it should. So let me try starting over again. Apologies, this may take a little bit longer. As I said, if you need to uh, go to your next class, that's totally fine. Um, I'll just continue and then make this recording so that you can uh, look at it later. So we're going to delete the delete this parametric sweep again and try it again. I'm going to delete this. And I'm also going to uh, delete this as well. Start over from the beginning. All right, so we'll right click on study one and do a parametric sweep. And um, we're going to again specify that we want to vary the voltage, and we want to vary that from uh, let's go, let's do zero through um, zero through six in steps of two. So zero two four six. All right. Um, now we've defined this parametric sweep. Um, and let us try computing it again. Okay, this time it seems to be working. So you're doing a parametric sweep here. And if you click here, you look under parametric solutions, you should be able to see uh, different, um, different options here. 
Now when we make our results table, let's make a two-dimensional plot group. And let's click, this time in our uh, 2D plot group, we're going to select parametric solutions. And in our parametric solutions, it'll uh, you'll be able to see that you can select what values of V that you want to look at the results for. So let's do our electrostatic potential plot again. We'll do a surface plot. And uh, we'll just call this uh, potential. And we'll plot it. And we'll try this for different values of, of V. Okay. And it looks like we're getting the same the same value here. Okay. So this is this is a problem. Um, you know, let me just open, let me do this in the interest of time, let me open the um, existing one. where we have the parametric results completed. And then uh, we won't bother saving the results here. All right, so in our results here, you notice that we have the data set and we have the parameter value three um, so what we did here is we varied the voltage between 0 and 5 volts. So you can see the results here for 0. For 0 volts you don't see any potential. And you click 5 volts and you can see the potential field here. And then, and so on for, for 3. So you can see how the electric field and, uh, and the potential changes. So, um, you know, I'll, I will post this one as an example, if, if that helps you all and uh, uh, that you can use as an example. And if, if there's, uh, you know, uh, I'll, I'll do some debugging on my own as to figure out why that parameter value didn't work in the demo that I showed you. It's supposed to, I followed the similar, um, you know, similar steps when I did this previous one. So again, you define your parametric sweep and you define a range here and then you run it. Um, I wanna show you one more thing real quick in the next couple minutes and then we'll be done. That you can also create a one-dimensional plot group. So if you right click on results and you create one dimensional plot group, something like this will show up. And um, from here you can see that uh, uh, this allows you to create plots like this. So what we're doing here is we're interested in looking at uh, what's gonna happen to the uh, electric field at a certain point as you increase the voltage. So let me rephrase that, let me mention again that what we're trying to do here, if we go to the geometry, we, we imagine that we have a point just here on the upper right, and we want to see how the uh, voltage of that point varies as a function of um, varies as a function of the applied potential. So, what we're doing here is we create, we right-click on one D plot group, and we add a point graph. Okay, and then we'll see something like this. And um, in that point graph, I'll just show you how to do this real quick. In in the point graph you can uh, define a uh, point. Um, you can define define a point here, excuse me, one, one right here. Let me just delete this new one that I made. So within this data set, what we did is we defined a point. So it's called a cut point 2D, all right? And when we define that, we you can create a point, R equals four, R equals, R over four, R over four. So we defined a point here, shown in red, saying that this is where we want to find our, uh, measure our electrostatic potential. And then here what we did, we said that in our point graph, we said that the data set that we want to use is the cut point 2D. So meaning we want to find the electrostatic potential only at that single point and for all the parameters of the, of the voltage that we selected. So we can plot this like so and we see a plot like this. 
we see that uh, when the electrostatic potential is set to zero, then of course that the, the voltage at the point is zero. And by the time we get up to five, the electrostatic potential at that point reaches close to one volt. Okay, so this is a way to see how the voltage at a point varies with respect to how much electrostatic potential you put on the electrodes. The final one I'll show you real quick is a 1D plot group where you're drawing lines. And in this example, we're, we're doing a line graph. And this time we're doing a cut line 2D instead of a cut point 2D. You can see the cut line 2D is here. And the way we created that, we right click on data sets and we do cut line, uh, cut line 2D is right here. And when we do a cut line, I'll plot this here, what we did is we defined a line going from here all the way up here. And we define a, a line just with two points, x equals negative r, y equals negative r, that's defining this leftmost point, and then the rightmost point up here, x equals r, y equals r. So we drew a line between these two points. And what we're interested in is what is the electric field along this line? Um, and so in this plot group, we right clicked on here, we created a line graph. When you create the line graph, this type, this shows up. The data set is the cut line that we just defined, and we define it for all the parameters. So if I just do the first parameter, meaning like if I just do it for uh, v equals zero, then you won't see any potential there. If I do it for v equals five, the last one, then you'll see um, the potential here like this. You can also do it for all of them at once, which is nice. So this is what the, the field distribution looks like along that diagonal line for V equals 5, V equals 4, V equals 3, and so on. And here you can, if you want to add another a, a little legend here, you can do that like so. All right, last thing to show you is that if you just want to save one of these images, just click here for image snapshot and um, just to say that you want to save this to a file, PNG, and you can save it as... Um, and you'll have that file that you can submit for your assignments. That's what I'm going to be looking for, screenshots and assignments. If you need to take screenshots, then you can use the clipping tool. Um, I believe it's called Snip. Ah, it's a snipping tool. For screenshots, I suggest you use this. You can click New. Just draw a square over the area that you want to save, and then you can save that uh, save that file for your submissions. Okay, um, all right, thanks for um, staying on extra. Uh, any questions uh, before we'll just wrap up here? Okay, I can see some of you are on here. Any, uh, any questions? Am I posting a homework soon? Yes, I will expect to post a homework um, probably sometime today or tomorrow, and that, that will be due uh, next week. I'll have more information on that soon. All right, good. So we'll stop right here. Um, remember, after you're done with your simulations, you can always save. So just keep this in mind. If you save something to... Um, if you save something to the desktop, you will definitely lose it. So I would suggest that you can either connect your USB device and save save it to your USB device, or you can save it in um, within your OneDrive. When you log into VLAB, you'll notice that your OneDrive will show up here, and you can actually save it there. But when you do save things, remember that wait um, wait until it has synced to the server. So I can see that these two files are still synch synchronizing. There, it has not been saved yet. So what I actually need to do is get out of console so that these files can save and give them the opportunities to save before logging out. Otherwise, what's going to happen is you will lose those files later. All right, so I'm just going to wait here until the file completes syncing. So uh, I think we'll end here for today. Uh, thank you for uh, your um, sustained attention. I know we ran a little bit over again. We just have to make sure that we're getting through a lot of this material. Um, and as usual, the lectures will be posted online. Homeworks will also be posted soon. And uh, uh, good luck with everything. Uh, any questions, please let me know. All right, so let me just stop the recording here.